I was the deputy director at the National Security Agency from 2006 through 2014. I had the privilege of working at the National Security Agency for 28 years. Um, I was, of course, at the National Security Agency in the Chief Operating Officer role when Edward Snowden came out in the summer of 2013. I did watch the movie, um, Snowden, made by Oliver Stone. Uh, it was a hard thing to watch, uh, not because it was revealing a truth that I'd want to put away, but because I was in a constant state of wonder about the misappropriation of the truth, the fabrication and exaggeration that is rife throughout the movie. To portray him as someone who had significant authority was a senior advisor to the CIA, had been personally sent by the then deputy director, which would have been me, um, to Hawaii to effect some extraordinary program. Um, none of that was true. It would be, frankly, quite unusual um, for someone who's the chief operating officer of an organization to reach into the workforce, find a contractor who's doing um, IT work, relatively traditional routine IT work, and give them a Jason Bourne-like assignment. The second error fact um, is a description of what NSA does. Um, so the telephone metadata program collected just the, the number that called, the number that was called, the time and date duration of that call. Uh, there was no content in that database. There was no identity in that database, no names. And yet the movie is a very graphical, impressive characterization um, up on the screen of pictures and content and connections and social identities grossly incorrect. In pursuit of national security, you don't have the right, the obligation, the authority to sacrifice individual privacy. So when the movie characterizes NSA employees as being cavalier, glib, um, essentially seeing individual privacy as something to be um, trifled with or to run roughshod over, uh, that's a gross mischaracterization. Uh, the movie would have you believe that there was a singular moment at which Edward Snowden decided to steal information and ultimately give that to the press. The movie would say that that happened sharply in the spring of 2013. He started to actually steal information as early as June of 2012. So from that period until the time he came out was a very long period of time. As hard as this conversation is to have anywhere, this is a great place to have it. Uh, this is sacred ground. Not far from where I'm sitting, there's a wall. It's a memorial wall. It's a facsimile of an actual granite wall that sits over at the main campus. And on that particular wall are 174 names, names of people who since 1952 have been killed in the line of duty. We talk a lot about Edward Snowden, an army of one who was judge and jury about what he misunderstood or perhaps simply chose to get wrong about the National Security Agency. We talk far too seldom about the people who've been killed pursuing national security while at the same time defending the rights of individuals to pursue their lives within the United States or globally. So clearly there's going to be a challenge for anybody that sees the Snowden movie that from a distance reads uh, the rhetoric that's in the press or even from national security officials as to what do I believe, how do I believe that, how do I have confidence that I know the true story. A good place to look is in a report that was recently issued by the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. There was no minority opinion. They all agreed Edward Snowden is a serial fabricator. Those were the words they used, a serial exaggerator and a serial fabricator. That he had done great, grievous harm to the United States and allied interest, uh, measured on the one hand in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, but more importantly in, in terms of national security threats that either are not covered or that we may have suffered um, in that period in between. Much of what he revealed had nothing to do with privacy, despite the fact that that was his claim, that, that these were violations of privacy. The vast majority of what he released, recklessly in their view, had to do with national security. The report makes it very clear that he was not a whistleblower. There are avenues he could have taken anonymously. There are avenues he could have taken with express protection for whatever his views might be, uh, but he took none of them. He essentially decided, based upon a cursory observation of what was transpiring at NSA, he was not an analyst, he had no means to know what these programs were really doing, and he had no reason to look into that. He decided what was the right answer and took that to the mic. None of us in this country get to decide these things on behalf of all of us alone. All of us are accountable to due process. All of us are accountable to make sure that we consider not just our own individual interest, but the collective interest of the society within which we live. Edward Snowden is crying out for justice. Edward Snowden wants to come home. Um, those who argue for that um, argue that he's done a great service um, to the society. Um, while we do have a richer, uh, more fulsome conversation between and amongst the parties that try to create the alignment of national security, collective security, individual privacy interest, um, we also have uh, a lot of scar tissue. We've got a lot of damage done. 
and the reckless, egregious nature by which Snowden has done that, in my view, does not deserve a pardon. It deserves, it warrants an explanation. Um, so I don't think that I would pardon um, the inexcusable, egregious, reckless behavior of Edward Snowden. I would give him a full and fair opportunity to explain that. Um, and if, upon having explained that, he shows that he's done not simply what he believes is the right thing, but he did it the right way, then by all means, justice should be served.